In the middle of the Mojave Desert, one of the most storied cities in the world, this is Las Vegas, where fortunes are won and lost, where lives are made and destroyed, where the house always wins until it can't. A lot of pain out here in Las Vegas, a lot of stress, a lot of fear. Wham, the bottom of the barrel. One gambler preyed on the casinos at their weakest moment and walked away with more than $15 million in a single winning streak. People say you do play perfectly, Don. If you have an edge, if you play long enough over a large enough sample size of hands, you're gonna win. Eventually, he swings the math in his favor. Did he cheat? Is it luck or simply skill? I'm Trish Regan. Join me for the story of how one blackjack player found a whole new way to beat the odds. Forty million people flock to the Vegas Strip each year, but most only get a peek at the spectacle that is Las Vegas. To see it all, you need to be a high roller, willing to spend $100,000 a hand. Someone like Don Johnson. <laughs> Don is, as they call him in the industry, a whale, meaning he risks millions in the casinos and makes millions too. He's a legendary gambler. He won $15 million in one streak from some of the biggest casino brands in the business. His game is blackjack, and he hits the casinos just when they can least afford it. When Don Johnson walks in a club, dancers show off his initials, and celebrities pay their respects. The scene is all engineered by the casinos, because they want to win his money. I want Don to show me how he beats the casinos at their own game. Hi. Hi, Trish. So nice, nice to, to meet, meet you. you. My guide to Las Vegas treats the casino like a battlefield. He studies the industry, its strengths, and its shortcomings. To know Las Vegas, he says, you have to start at the beginning. So where we're heading right now? Fremont Street, old city where all of Vegas started. Do you come here and gamble? Uh, more just to play around and have fun. Come down here because it's nostalgic. Gamblers often learn to play here because the bets are low. And it's relaxed, friendly. The first Vegas casinos opened here back in the 1930s. This is history. This was the beginning of what ultimately became the Vegas Strip. Five miles south, enormous tourist-filled casinos flash their glittering lights. This is the famous Vegas Strip, and it lives up to its reputation. Gaudy, but above all, full of promise, possibility, excitement. Two giant companies dominate the Strip, MGM and Caesars Entertainment. The last time Don played at a Caesars property, he walked out the door with $4 million in blackjack winnings. Since then, the company is, shall we say, less welcoming. The upper management at Caesars uh, took a position that uh, my type of business isn't something that they want to build a portfolio on. In fact, it's the exact opposite. I wonder why. Maybe long term, they just determine they can't make money off of someone like me. I can accept that. That's fine. He says he's been barred from Caesars for life. Is that because he's too good? We can't nor would we bar you from coming to the casino. What we won't do is solicit him with expensive inducements to come to the casino. While Gary Loveman, the CEO of Caesars, may not offer Don perks anymore, nearly all the other big companies spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on Don just to get him in the door. So if they want you to spend and they know that you can spend big, they'll make it really easy for you to be here. The catering to high-end players starts before they even think about coming here. They'll bring a player from the East Coast to Las Vegas. The MGM property has the mansion, which is 29 villas under a climate-controlled uh, dome. And you get to stay for free? Well, nothing's free. It's all factored into the game. I'll give you a little secret inside baseball on, on, on casinos. How the 
Jim Murren is the CEO of MGM. He owns 10 Vegas casinos, and Don is getting perks at every one of them. Let's say you're going to spend about $1,000. Theoretically, we're going to win $200 from you, about 20% of the money you, you circulate. So the house engineers a statistical advantage. On average, you'll lose that 20% of the money you play. So are there certain games where you have a better edge over the player than others? The best chance of beating the casino is with Baccarat. And that's followed by perfect strategy of blackjack, playing straight up craps, and then every game in between has its different set of holds. If you play the big six wheel, that wheel that we always stick right in the front of the casino, you don't have much of a chance. My guys are gonna hate me for saying this because <laughs> we do really well on that. If the house wins so predictably, how do casinos keep gamblers coming back? The answer, perks. We're gonna win, theoretically, $200. I can comp you to induce you to come out here. Mm -hmm. I'll give you about $80 worth of stuff. And the more money spent, the more money casinos make. Now move the math up to a whale. If a whale is gonna theoretically lose $200,000, I should be willing to give him $80,000 worth of stuff. But you can't eat that much caviar. You know, even if I fly you from point A to point B, I'm probably not burning $80,000 worth of fuel. So the margin on the high end, the margin on the whales, is higher. High rollers generate an estimated 25% of all gaming revenue on the strip. But here's the thing. You have to have their length of play. The longer people play, statistically, the Better house is going to win which is why casinos will do just about anything to keep the whales playing. Easy transportation. Very easy transportation. A, a nice room. Beautiful rooms. Alcohol. Well, there's always alcohol. Food. So whatever you want. Yeah, they're going to try and customize a package. If the player is big enough, they're going to try and give him what he wants. Problem is, Don Johnson is no ordinary whale. Because the more he plays, the more he wins. His biggest single night was at the Tropicana. Take me back. What happened? I beat him big. I think a lot of it just had to do with a huge bet that you can put down. When I had a three, four, five, six, seven, eight hundred thousand dollar hand out there, I won those. It's very, very difficult to lose if you win those big bets. He racked up five point six million dollars in chips before management cut him off. Did word spread throughout the casino? There I think it spread through the entire town. And then when I woke up later on, then I'd gotten several phone calls from different casinos asking if it was true. And yet the casinos were calling you to see if you wanted to come play at their place? Sure. I think at that point they, they felt, that, look, I mean, he's won it there. Why not get him to come in over here? We'll see if we uh, can get him to lose part of it back or all of it back. But Don rarely loses. He went on to gamble at two more casinos during that trip and won another $10 million before he quit. I guarantee you anybody at home watching this right now probably thinks, he counted cards. That's how he did it. <laughs> is there more to it than that? Monkeys can count cards. Card counting alone is not going to get you all the way there. I knew that I had a better chance of winning than I did of losing against them, so I took advantage of it. People say you do play perfectly, Don. If you have an edge, if you play long enough over a large enough sample size of hands, you're going to win. What gave him an edge, he says, was knowing the game, the players, and most importantly, understanding the odds on the casino floor. So it's all just math? All of it's math. Everything on this casino floor is math, just like a Wall Street trading floor. You're trying to find inefficiencies in the way they offer their games. And when you find an inefficiency, yes, you're gonna take advantage of it. Don found an inefficiency in the casino's perk system. Sometimes they give away too much. There's a natural collision of interest between the marketing side of a casino and the operation side of a casino. The marketing side of the casino wants to buy the business. They want to give away as much as possible to try and get players in. If he could resist all the superficial enticements the casinos dangled in front of him, Don realized he could negotiate something far more valuable. It will test you. It'll test you a lot, and it's hard. How Don Johnson turned the perk system to his advantage when we come back. The Bellagio, 
one of the most dazzling casinos on the Strip. A lot of people gather right here. We're outside the Bellagio Hotel, and they gather here because this really is one of the best views in all of Vegas. You can see pretty much the whole strip. You've got everything from Caesar's Palace there all the way down, Treasure Island, the Venetian back there, and of course, the Eiffel Tower. High rollers come to the Bellagio's Hyde nightclub to enjoy one of the most expensive perks in the city. Wow, I like this table. Absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> really neat. What makes this table worth $250,000 a night? This red button. Okay, here we go. Wow. <laughs> now I believe it. You know, it cost them 10 grand every time they fire these things no off. I just want to keep hitting it's the button. Be an expensive <laughs> night. The Bellagio and its sibling property, the Mirage, transformed the Vegas Strip in the 90s. Both were designed by one man, Steve Wynn. They made him the most legendary casino magnate alive today. What it takes to dazzle everybody today is a hundred times more ambitious, complex, and challenging than before. Wynn is the nemesis of every whale on the Strip because he's always inventing new temptations to keep them in the casino. From nightclubs to shows to celebrity chef restaurants. And they're all coming here for the experience. We've trained the public and raised their expectations. A good thing. A good thing for Steve Wynn because when Don Johnson's on a winning streak, he heads to Wynn's new clubs to celebrate. What is it about his properties that are different than everything else here? Steven's a perfectionist. It's as though spare no expense. If you build it, people will come. The win and do they? And they do. They do. Thousands of them show up in these clubs. Win was an unlikely candidate for the most influential casino developer in history. How does an English major from the University of Pennsylvania wind up becoming a casino mogul? The question even more appropriately is, how does a boy of opportunity take up a life of crime? <laughs> <laughs> he can joke about Vegas's criminal history because he was one of the first casino moguls without ties to the mob. Wynn's casinos are financed by Wall Street and inspired by high-end hotels of the 1950s, especially the Fontainebleau in Miami Beach. I would go on vacation to the Fontainebleau and I would watch the people behave in this place with such joy and happiness. It was utopian. And the guy that built the place, he marched around with his beautiful wife. And the only thing that I could think of is, it's good to be king. <laughs> that's, that's what it looked like to me. He eventually would become king of Las Vegas, but he started out small, working in his father's bingo halls. In the early 1970s, he took over the Golden Nugget Casino in old downtown. But it wasn't until he opened Mirage in 1989 that Wynn got to show off his talent for spectacle. Outside, a volcano explodes every night. I think every developer demonstrates what he thinks of the public by the product he creates. If you believe that people have discretion, that they know the difference and will respond to it, then you'll dish it up to them even if it costs more, with the confidence that it'll pay off. He says that kind of fun is the key to winning in Las Vegas. Keep them entertained and gamblers will lose every single one of them. My father was a problem gambler. He knew he wasn't gonna win, he just liked the game more than the money. We'll go and grab the biggest players in the building. I'll ask them off the record to tell you why they're risking 50,000 a roll on dice. Why are you doing it? Do you have some purpose in mind? Uh -huh. Yes, to amuse myself. I like the game. Have you ever worried that you've had a problem with gambling? You, know, you worry at times. Yeah? You, know, you, you want to make sure that the, is your mind sound, and it, it will test you. It'll test you a lot, and it's hard. How do you know when to stop? I mean, if you're up a million, you're up two million, what keeps you going to 5.8 million? They ran out of chips. Don says he wins because as much as he may like the clubs, he doesn't let the Vegas lifestyle distract him. Instead, he stays focused, studying casinos, looking for signs of weakness. A couple of years ago, he noticed something that would give him the ultimate edge. 
I don't see as many uh, big players as uh, what I saw just five years ago. I don't see the big action, not in Vegas. Is that just a result of the economy? I think a lot of it is a result of the economy, and I think um, a lot of the Asian players are playing overseas now. So all the more reason for casinos to try and woo someone like you to get you in the door. Yeah, man. The recession left casinos vulnerable to an attack by a killer whale like him. Are you exploiting weaknesses where you find them? We're not doing anything different than what a very smart hedge fund operator would do on Wall Street. He sees an inefficiency in a market and he starts buying stock. How the struggling casino industry provided Don Johnson with the biggest opportunity of his career when we come back. 4.25 million in the span of what, less than 24 hours? Probably around maybe 12 hours. At night, Las Vegas looks invincible. But fly over the strip at dawn and its secrets are revealed. These steel and concrete skeletons have taunted the city for five years. Evidence of the biggest commercial real estate bubble in history and its spectacular implosion. There's an awful lot of, uh, a lot of pain out here in Las Vegas. A lot, of, a lot of drama, a lot of stress, a lot of fear. MGM CEO Jim Murren is halfway through building a casino complex the size of a small city when Wall Street crashes. Banks stopped calling us back and we had 10,000 construction workers working on site and the banks stopped lending. So it was very difficult. Four more casino companies abandoned projects mid-construction. Do you think it's had a serious and drastic and lasting change on Vegas? The recession in Las Vegas stripped away the scab that was covering that the companies, many of them, had a capital structure that was reckless, immature, and naive. Steve Wynn's luxury towers now look out over the ruins of the Echelon, a casino project planned by the Boyds, Vegas's oldest casino family. In the, your entire time in Vegas, have you seen anything like 2008? Never. Never, never seen anything even close to it. Bill Boyd and the fellows who work for him, they're really nice people, right-thinking people. They drank the Kool-Aid a little bit on this multi-use development. But many in Vegas blamed Steve Wynn, saying it was he who started the commercial real estate bubble. The new strip is, you know, it's like the house that Steve built. Before Wynn built his gambling palaces, Vegas casinos were nearly impossible to finance, most funded by millionaires or the mob, and they relied on slot machines for revenue. I had a clear understanding of what to trust and what not to trust, and it wasn't a slot machine. Wynn brings new ambition to Vegas, targeting players with expensive taste. These people have a pent-up demand for the good life. Now, in my parents' age, it was a Cadillac, a mink stole and going to Las Vegas or gambling. And gambling was part of the good life. That's what the swells did. He turned to Wall Street and offered investors junk bonds, high interest loans that incentivized them to risk everything on his grand vision. When he did his masterpiece of Bellagio with the Bellagio fountains, and you really get to go in and experience it. Both Mirage and Bellagio blew through their budgets. MGM seized the properties in a hostile takeover. Wynn had gambled and lost. You want to criticize or find fault with guys like us, it's easy. We're so flawed in many ways that it's a, it's a turkey shoot if you want to go after us. But his instincts were right. His first strip casinos triggered what some might call a Vegas casino arms race. Suddenly, banks are writing blank checks to anyone willing to tear down an old casino and build one to compete with Steve Wynn. The Boyds, a Vegas family known for building small local casinos, are inspired to tear down the old stardust on the strip. So this was all blown up in 2008 to make way for one of the biggest casinos the Strip had ever seen. The Echelon would cover 88 acres, 
and cost a staggering $4.8 billion, four times the cost of Mirage, three times Bellagio, and almost twice what Wynn paid for Encore and Wynn. I don't know that Echelon was the right idea for them. What would have been wrong with a brand new Stardust? It was a great name. Something simple like that. How about a 2,500 room Stardust? Would have knocked everybody out. <clears throat> no, they had to build five hotels. Do you think in your heart of hearts there's an element of, of being a gambler yourself in business? I, I, you I think definitely there is. When we imploded the Stardust and started building Echelon, we couldn't foresee the recession coming. And when we shut it down in uh, August of 2008, we thought, well, well, we'll be down for six months to a year at the most, and then we'll restart. Nobody predicted what came next, including Steve Wynn. I had just opened two and a quarter billion dollar encore. I mean, if I had benefited from timing at moments in my life, this was payback time. Wham! Hello, December 22nd, 2008. I mean, the bottom of the barrel. Wynn struggled, but MGM was on life support. The company had gambled $9 billion on City Center, more than any private commercial real estate project in history. So you rolled the dice. We rolled the dice. We were all in. We were all in. Our stock went from 100 to 2. The banks said, you know, we're done. My financial $2 team. A share. Two dollars a share. We went down to a dollar eighty-one actually. A dollar eighty-one yeah. a share. My God. Yeah, because people felt that if if City Center went bankrupt, that MGM couldn't be far behind. MGM owned a third of all casinos on the Strip. If it went bankrupt, struggling Las Vegas was doomed. But City Center opened defiantly in two thousand nine. We restructured, we raised $23 billion of, of capital. Where'd you get the money? Mr. Kokorin, several other equity investors that believed in us, believed in the team, banks that did know us. They get a lot of debt. A lot of these companies have a lot of debt. Yeah, how, how, you know, at some point, how do you grow your way out of that? I, I don't know the answer to that. The crash in Las Vegas sends shockwaves through the entire casino industry. By 2009, the fallout is being felt across the country. In Atlantic City, casinos are desperate for quick profits and willing to offer whales major incentives. Don sees this as his opportunity. But right now, he's no whale. He's just an average blackjack player who needs to improve his game. I don't look at myself as a professional blackjack player. I only became a short-term professional blackjack player because they presented a deal that was so good that it was worth playing. How Don Johnson transformed himself from casual gambler into a killer whale. Next. Less than two hours from the Atlantic City boardwalk, over the Pennsylvania border sits the small town of Ben Salem, home to the Parks Casino and home to legendary blackjack player Don Johnson. I own the woods going back on this side and the casino owns everything on that side. Don shocked the gaming industry by winning $15 million at the blackjack tables. But he'd been prepped for this moment. Don learned to gamble here in rural Pennsylvania not at the blackjack table, but at the racetrack. He started out as a jockey. You don't look like a jockey. Hate to tell no, you that. No, no, I'm not. Those days, it was a different lifetime ago. <laughs> You're a little tall, a little broader. Six <laughs> one, two something. You must have been the biggest jockey they'd ever seen. No, I weighed 108. His days as a jockey numbered, Don moved on, finding work as a gaming regulator before becoming an employee at the old Parks racetrack. You work your way up and you're managing and then you're operating, you become a CEO of a track and you're running things for a corporation and what's the next natural transition for me was is I'd never really crossed over to the player side that much. But he wanted to gamble like the pros. I've watched them as a regulator, observed them, I observed them as an operator of a racetrack, but never actually participated with them. 
In 2003, he quit to become a professional horse better. He'd run sophisticated mathematical equations in an attempt to predict race outcomes. It made blackjack look easy, and he started playing cards in Atlantic City to relax. Used to playing casinos before, but more just recreationally, not really for big money. $25 bets would be a $100 bet would be a huge bet. But over time, he became a regular player. Those bets grew. Soon, he was wagering $15,000 a game. Let's talk a little bit about Atlantic City. How do you walk into some casinos in Atlantic City in the span of four months' time and collect 15 million bucks? It was a time when Atlantic City was, I, I think they were desperate for business and they were over pitching um, some of the games. Atlantic City casinos, owned by MGM, the Boyds, and Caesars, began calling Don, offering $50,000 in free bets just to get him in the door. The deals were so good, Don suspected Atlantic City was in worse shape than any other gambling city in the country. Vegas has enough critical mass and they have a huge convention business. Some fairly major properties that can do a lot of cross-marketing with different properties they own around the country now. But the cross-marketing strategy that keeps Las Vegas strong also steals business from Atlantic City. Vegas casinos, anxious to grow profits outside the Strip, are pitching small, regional casinos throughout the country. States hungry for tax dollars are embracing these casinos, every single one of them. Overall, I call it a win-win. It's going to generate hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue. Let's do gaming right, and let's take the first step this year. For Atlantic City, new competition means big losses. Since 2006, 16 local casinos have sprung up around Atlantic City, and they're all siphoning players and profits from the boardwalk. I think Atlantic City, they're losing too much of their business now. There's just too much competition in surrounding states. Started with Delaware, Pennsylvania's put a lot of pressure on them. New York has gaming now. They're soon to be expanding in New York. It's just a matter of time before it's gonna go back to being a beach town. Atlantic City is a very challenged place. Yes. What's your take on AC right now? I am concerned. Jim Murren is the CEO of MGM, which co-owns Atlantic City's high-end Borgata. We want to make La City come back. Do you worry at all that there's a lot of saturation in that market? I do. We have to be very targeted. We have to remember the lessons learned in the recession and not repeat them, not grab every market just because it happens to be there, not be a, a glutton for development. MGM's rival, Caesars, has an insatiable appetite for building. CEO Gary Loveman has built casinos in Pennsylvania and Maryland that will compete with the company's own flagship in Atlantic City. Atlantic City, that's the poster child for why it's been tough, because there's been so much regional expansion. You're part of that. You've got casinos everywhere. Well, we do, but it's a complicated problem. In every instance where an adjoining state legalizes and puts pressure on an incumbent state, of course, that's a business problem we have to solve. So Loveman, a former Harvard marketing professor, argues regional casinos are necessary because they drive business back to his Vegas properties. And a lot of locals are hopefully loyal to the brand. So you're a Cleveland guest, you've been treated very well at our place there, now you want to go to Las Vegas, and you have two options. You could just be a traditional purchaser online of my competitor's offering, mm -hmm. or you could call your Cleveland host who would engage with his or her colleague here and arrange exactly what you want, the right check-in experience, the right room type, the right event access, and that's the proposition that we want to deliver. It's a proposition that does deliver for Vegas, and it's part of the reason profits there only declined slightly in the past few years, while Atlantic City lost 40% of its revenue. And it's why Atlantic City's casinos were desperate enough to offer high-stake gamblers like Don Johnson whatever advantages they wanted. What happened to the old expression, the house always wins? The house can't always win. You're going to see big swings when you let people bet 50000 to to 100000 uh, a hand. Once you're ahead of the house a couple million dollars, why not just keep playing? Find out exactly how Don Johnson did it. Coming up. Atlantic City, winter 2010. Crime rates rival only those of Detroit. Casino profits are in a free fall. Casinos will do anything to win back high rollers. 
It's the opportunity of a lifetime for newly turned blackjack player Don Johnson. He's about to stun the gaming industry, walking away with $15 million. The key to Don's success, what he negotiates with the casinos up front. They'll negotiate for high-end players if you're playing big enough, and they'll negotiate the discount policy. How much do you have to be playing? Three hands, 5,000, 15,000 a swing. 15,000 a swing may not get a player VIP treatment in Vegas, but when Don bets that much in Atlantic City, it gets the casino's attention. What kind of terms do they offer you? The right game, with the right odds, with the right discount policy. Why do you think they gave you such a big discount and changed the rules? Because they were giving it to other players, and they had some success in beating some other players. But the casinos don't realize Don set a trap. He's not the mid-level player he appears to be. He's an industry insider who knows exactly what terms to negotiate. For starters, he wants big bets. They were letting me play 25,000 a hand by three hands, so 75,000 a swing. At 75,000 a swing, it's not that hard to win $4 million. It's also not that hard to lose $4 million. I didn't have $4 million to lose. That was the key. He doesn't have $4 million to lose because he negotiates himself a discount, a 20% rebate on all his losses. If he gambles $4 million, he'll only lose 3.2. Over the entire course of play, that matters. I haven't worked in a property that's actually, in my mind, been dumb enough to get themselves in that situation. Mark Oppenheimer negotiates with high rollers for the Parks Casino. Frankly, some casinos haven't paid enough attention and have made millions of dollars for Don because they haven't thought through the math. Don't these casinos have mathematical algorithms, models that they've put in place to make sure that someone like you can't come in and walk away with nearly six million bucks in one night? I think they need to have made an evaluation on you as a player, some kind of track record, some kind of file some kind of past performance where they've now judged you as a player and said, this is a player that we think we can beat. Why would the casinos think they could beat Don? In the case of Don Johnson, why is it that your casino would be willing to negotiate terms that would not be as favorable to you, but would really benefit the player more? Why do that? Well, we try not to do that past a certain point. I mean, we're doing this, hopefully, in a completely dispassionate, mathematized way. Caesars granted Don's request based on a record of his past performance. Does it somehow get logged in the computer so a particular person who plays extremely well, there's a note on, on their profile? Yes. The note on Don's file said he was a mediocre player. How did you suddenly become such a great blackjack player? probably helps to have some friends that understand uh, the mathematics behind each of the games. Shortly before taking Atlantic City for millions, Don hooked up with a team of Ivy League math PhDs. Did they help figure out how to best stack the odds? Well, yeah, the different mathematicians have different skills. The mathematicians turned down Bloomberg Television's request for an interview, but Don says they coached him making him into what the casinos consider the perfect blackjack player. I walk into a casino. What are the odds I'm going to get versus the odds you're getting? You're probably going to play a game that's 300% worse. 300% worse? 300% worse. The odds a player like me is going to beat the house? About 49%. So while I may strike it lucky, I won. The longer I play, the more likely I'll lose. How discouraging. But still, I believe in the statistical analysis. I do. And statistical analysis says, even though the house has the edge, I can improve my odds if I improve my game. I want to win. You want to win. <laughs> you need to do some studying before you go in. Everybody can get the basic strategy card in the gift shop. It's going to make you at least a better than average blackjack player. This is a basic strategy table. It lists each card and tells players when to hit, hold, and double down. Only problem? Casinos don't allow a lot of these moves. So once Don secured the right advantages and discounts, he turns his attention to the rules of the game. 
you tweak uh, two or three things uh, one way or, or the other uh, enough and a game goes from being negative to positive. Once Don negotiates his edge, it's time for battle at the blackjack table. And make a mistake that's in your favor, you're gonna collect on it. Those are like free bets. The art of casino warfare when the player continues. Every casino gambler in Atlantic City knows when you play at the blackjack table, the odds aren't in your favor. The house always wins, and the rules are set in stone. But what if you could change the rules and twist the odds? If you change one of the rules, one way or another, in favor of the house or in favor of the player, it's going to change the odds of the game. Don Johnson did what gamblers dream about. He turned the table on the dealers, stole the house edge, and the casinos never saw it coming. Some players have specific, you know, desires or wants. Keith Smith is CEO of Boyd Gaming, which co-owns the Borgata. His marketers were so anxious for Don's business, they allowed him to tweak the rules of play. Whether they want to touch the cards or don't touch the cards, or whether they're dealt a certain way, and in large part, if it doesn't affect the odds of the game, and is not in violation of regulations that are in place, then the customer can be accommodated. But when Don played at the Borgata, the rules he negotiated helped him line his pockets with $5 million. So walk me through the rules that they gave you that were so advantageous to you. Like standing on soft 17. If the dealer gets an A6, the dealer has to stand on that hand instead of taking another card. So if you're sitting with an 18, 19, 20, or even a 21, you're gonna win. Doubling on any two cards. Doubling your bet. Yes, some places have rules that won't allow you to do that. They will only let you double if you have a nine, 10, or an 11. Splitting hands up to four hands. You're going to split the hand because you have two twos. This, yeah. is, this is where the doubles with splits. You can split this against the dealers too. You can split up to four times. And I've done it. It happened that night at the Trop. I'd split up the four hands with doubles. I had an $800,000 hand. And it hit. Even with his rules, the 20% discount, and the big bets Don negotiated, the house still had a tiny advantage. There is a house edge built into it of about 0.25, three tenths of a percent. Not satisfied with those odds, Don figured out how to tip the game in his favor. You need to be better than the dealer. Because if you can beat the dealer, you can beat the house. There aren't enough players that come in that they're gonna deal 100,000 a hand to. They're nervous. And Don keeps them nervous by insisting on complicated side bets and hand signals, like surrender. If Don gestures like this and the dealer doesn't notice, it's a free bet for Don. So you had to establish up front all these rules before you even walked in to play the game? Yes. So a lot of the dealers aren't used to dealing these rules. They often make mistakes. They make a mistake that's in your favor, you're going to collect on it. Those are like free bets. I like the pressure. David Darby has been a dealer at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas for eight years. He sees a lot of high rollers like Don. What's the biggest winnings that, that you've ever seen? Millions. Millions. But how does a dealer know if a player is trying to trip him up? You know right away, if it's a brand new customer you've never met, you feel them out. So when the odds at the table are nearly 50-50, it comes down to this, psychological warfare between the gambler and the dealer. So how does that unfold if you're the dealer and you start noticing that those bets are getting sizably mm -hmm. larger? Do you call your floor manager? The dealer has, is empowered to do many things. Slow down the game, call in a supervisor, they can take a break, they can change dealers. Do they change the dealer? Do they try and change the circumstances of the game well, of when you're winning do. that much? Of course they do. Does it get emotional? It's not an easy thing to do, to sit there and play for hours and hours and hours and maintain the type of focus that you need not to make mistakes. But if you start making mistakes, you're not gonna get free play. They're just mistakes. So it requires a lot of discipline. A lot of discipline. 
Can you encourage them to make mistakes? Is there something that you do when you sit down that effectively helps to intimidate them or distract them? I've had all kinds of distractions for dealers. I've had porn stars play with me. During the AVN Awards in Las Vegas, I've had uh, you know five, six, seven, eight different girls that would pose as a girlfriend. So Is it's- Is this to distract the dealer? Of course. There's Does it work? Yeah, there's always a circus <laughs> going on. To them, if it, the more it looks like one giant party, the better it is for my side of the table. If there's a distraction, they make a mistake, what, what's the worst that can happen? I get a free bet. It's a great game, I bring it on. Yeah. There's a reason a dealer doesn't want to say no to a gambler, no matter how outrageous his behavior. The reason that why we work in this business is because we, all of our income is based upon tips. What we make hourly is, is minimum. So even if the dealer talks a big game, Don says the player is in control. They don't deal this type of game often enough for them to protect themselves from making mistakes. They make two mistakes in a night, three mistakes in a night, I got two, three hundred thousand dollars in free bets. You make too many of those mistakes in a night, you can't beat me. Especially if you're giving me a 20% discount. Especially if you're giving me 50,000 walking in and free bets to start off with. And you know immediately when they've made a mistake. I think I've caught every mistake that they've made that was not in my favor and made them give me the free bet because those are the rules of the game. Don has won hundreds of thousands of dollars in free bets by outwitting the dealers. It's allowed him to finally erase the house advantage. Add in the special rules and discounts he negotiates before the game, and Don now has an edge over the house. So the more he plays, the more he wins. It's how Don Johnson took $4 million from Caesars in a year when the casino giant posted some of its worst losses ever. It's how he beat the Borgata for $5 million, more than its owner's total profits the previous year. The CEO who authorized his spending limit at the Tropicana? Fired. It's how ultimately Don Johnson took on the casino industry in Atlantic City, won $15 million, and became the legendary gambler who beat the house. Can Don's success be replicated? Might he strike again? Coming up, find out how Don Johnson believes he'll gain his next edge over the casinos. He's a celebrity in Vegas, a favorite at the clubs, and a household name at the casinos. But Don Johnson is now banned at nearly every table on the Strip. His $15 million win in Atlantic City may have catapulted him to superstar status in Vegas. But now the casinos want his advice more than his business. So he's hit the speaking circuit. You need to know your player. You need to determine whether or not his skill level has changed. You need to know the people that are at the table with the player. Despite all the advice he offers up, Don says many casinos are still vulnerable. I heard you actually won another $2 million at the Chop of Ghana. Yeah, I won. Did the Chop just not learn their lesson? Well, it doesn't that they, they were still letting people bet big. If some casinos are still allowing big bets, it's because gaming profits haven't rebounded since the recession. What do you think some of the biggest lessons for you were in 2008? This used to be a place where gamblers would go on vacation. Now it's a place where vacationers may or may not gamble. While the casino companies turned Vegas into a playground of excess to lure in whales like Don, today it's this non-stop party that's bringing back profits lost on the casino floor. Last year, these clubs did $160 million. During eight and nine, it was the only part of my business in Las Vegas that was growing. But casinos can't survive on bottle service alone. To boost gambling revenue, Wynn and his rivals, MGM and Las Vegas Sands, tapped into the lucrative Chinese market, where gambling is part of the culture. 70% of your revenue comes from Macau right now. The only thing I could say, it's good to be in the right place at the right time. <laughs> and it's a two-way street. One Asian casino is betting big on Vegas. 
Genting purchased the Boyd's neglected Echelon site and, hoping to lure its Macau-based patrons to the U.S., is planning the first Asian casino on the Strip. Las Vegas still represents the greatest vacation package available to world travelers. So I see Las Vegas surviving. Don Johnson isn't so sure. Do you see anything on the horizon for Vegas? I mean, what's Vegas's future right now? I think it's going to be a long time before Vegas comes back to its, to its peak days. I don't think it's happening anytime soon. He's still studying Vegas, trying to exploit its inefficiencies from his home in Pennsylvania. He's building a software program, using data to map out the gaming industry's weak points and reveal where a player like him should strike next. You know, for my life, I find it intriguing. It's fun. You know, I love it. I enjoy it, and I'm going to continue doing it. In another life, do you think you could have worked on Wall Street? I'm not done yet. I'm, maybe I'll do it in this life. You like Vegas? I like Vegas. What do you like about it? You can love and hate Vegas at the same time.